Hello, I'm Matt Bancoli and welcome to Navara Live. Now, you might normally know me as a co-host of the show, but they've given me the big boy chair today. I'm going to be hosting the show today. And for my first foray into hosting the show, I'm joined by the wonderful Ash Sarkar. Ash, how are you? I'm feeling great. I'm so excited to be a part of your maiden voyage. And can I say, I, like everyone else watching, I just want to be like Mike, you know? I want to be like Mike. <laughs> Coming up later tonight, uh, the government and train driver union, ASLEF, have reached a pay deal. The Met Police have been found to be performing it inadequately in a number of areas. And education is on the agenda with today being A-level results day. Stay tuned for all of that, but first we turn to Gaza and Israel's ongoing war on the region. Israel has now killed over 40,000 people in Gaza in a campaign of genocide against the Palestinian people. The grim milestone comes after the IDF bombed Khan Yunis in southern Gaza yesterday and targeted a school housing thousands of displaced Palestinians over the weekend. Of those 40,000 killed, 16,500 were children. And that shocking total represents almost 2% of the pre-war population of Gaza. Now, 40,000 deaths is very likely to be an underestimate. According to local officials, up to 10,000 bodies remain buried under rubble of collapsed buildings. And even with a halt in fighting, the conditions under which 2 million displaced people are living will mean that there are very likely to be many who die from disease and hunger. But... The death toll alone doesn't capture the extent of the horror inflicted on Gaza by Israel. There have now been over 90,000 Palestinians wounded in the war, with many facing life-changing injuries, including loss of limbs, entire families have been wiped out, and there are now more than 21,000 orphans in the enclave. Meanwhile, those who continue to live endure harassment and abuse at the hands of IDF soldiers. They're being used as human shields, denied access to medical treatment, and subjected to countless evacuation orders, even from places deemed safe. Even medical staff aren't safe from abuse. Ben Thomas, who's a Canadian doctor who volunteered in a Gaza hospital, this is what he saw. In March, when I was in Gaza, I met a patient who was a physician. He had been working in the hospital when the Israeli military initially bombarded the hospital. Then they entered the hospital, instructed all the patients and the staff to leave. My patient insisted that he needed to stay behind to care for his patients, who many of whom couldn't leave. He was then told to strip naked at gunpoint, then held at gunpoint for hours and in fact for two entire days. Um, he was only allowed to urinate and to defecate on the floor where he stood beside a puddle of his own urine and feces, fearing for his life at gunpoint for two days. He wasn't allowed to access his medications, including his own insulin, to treat his diabetes. Um, eventually, the Israeli military instructed him to care for his patients, uh, who remained there, some of them. Uh, but they didn't allow him to dress before they did this. And they laughed because all of his patients were children. I saw him because he developed a terrible heel ulcer from standing at gunpoint for days, then migrating south to Rafa. This man was so traumatized, I honestly can't imagine him ever practicing medicine again. Despite all this carnage, Israel's attack on the Palestinian population continues. And even its staunchest ally, the US, has now admitted that Israel's only reason for continuing its military campaign inside Gaza is to harm civilians. Several US government officials have told the New York Times that there is no more the IDF can do in Gaza to degrade Hamas's capabilities. They also say that continuing the bombing campaign is, quote, only increasing the risk to civilians. And even Yohav Gallant, Israel's defense minister, has admitted that the only way to secure the remaining ho Israeli hostages is a ceasefire. That remark earned him a rebuke from Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who continues to pursue the impossible goal of total victory over Hamas. Without Netanyahu's support, hopes for a deal during the new ceasefire negotiations taking place today in Doha are fading, and Hamas have also refused to take part, releasing this statement. Out of concern and responsibility towards our people and their interest, the movement demands the mediators to present a plan to implement what they presented to the movement and agreed upon on July 2nd, 2024. 
based on Biden's vision and the UN's Security Council resolution and to compel the occupation to do so instead of going for further negotiations or new proposals. That's a reference to a proposed US peace deal, one that would see a temporary ceasefire turn into a permanent one over three phases. Israel has consistently refused to commit to it, but Israel's negotiation position is not as strong as it once was. Iran is poised to attack the country in retaliation for its assassination of previous Hamas leader Ismail Hanaye in Tehran last month. Iranian officials have been clear that the only a ceasefire will divert its planned bombardment of Israel, and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon continues to bomb northern Israel over the assassination of one of its leaders in South Beirut. The instability in the region caused by Israel's relentless attack on Gaza has also had a negative impact on the country economically. International credit rating agency, Fitch, cut Israel's credit rating earlier this week, reporting the country's outlook as negative and predicting the war will continue into 2025. And according to reports in the Israeli press, over 46,000 businesses have declared bankruptcies in the country since the war began. Israel is also sitting on an enormous budget deficit. To fund the war, the country had to sell off billions of dollars in debt, including a record $8 billion bond sale in March. But it's now emerged that pro-Palestinian activists almost succeeded in making the country's ability to trade those bonds more difficult. Barclays Bank reportedly planned to withdraw from future Israeli bond auctions under pressure from pro-Palestinian activists. The bank had been targeted by activists in the UK, including by disrupting its annual shareholders meeting in May and protesting at branches over its relationship with Israel and its defence contractors. Unfortunately, Barclays changed its mind, reaffirming its commitment to Israel on Wednesday. I guess genocide turns a profit. Whilst those protests may not have led to Barclays enacting change for the better, protests elsewhere have led to high-profile resignation. Because, imagine this for a second. Imagine your students were protesting over Israel's war in Gaza. What would you do? Would you call the cops? That's exactly what President of Columbia University, Minush Shafiq, did. She has now stepped down following months of criticism over her handling of the student protest that took place at the New York-based university. Columbia students were at the heart of campus-based protests against Israel's war on Gaza, triggering a wave of encampments across the US. But in April, Shafiq called law enforcement to remove her own students occupying a university building. Now that heavy-handed tactic led to arrest and a violent dismantling of a university's peace camp. In her resignation letter, Shafiq said this. It has been distressing for the community, for me as president, and on a personal level, to find myself, colleagues, and students the subject of threat and abuse. As President Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. We must do all we can to resist the forces of polarization in our community. But don't feel too sorry for Shavik, who's also a baroness in the House of Lords. She's taken up a job with British Foreign Secretary. David Lammy, where she will chair a review on the government's approach to international development. Now, something tells me she'll fit right into Keir Starmer's administration. Ash, what do you make of all this? So I think that Manoush Shafiq is a really interesting example of someone who's been squeezed by both sides. So on the one hand, what you've got are student protesters exercising their democratic right to free speech, who under pressure from right-wing pro-Israel donors, Manoush Shafiq called the police on, right? It had nothing to do with campus safety. It had everything to do with the fact that uh, donors who provide millions of dollars to Columbia University were threatening to, to withdraw their funding. So she was like, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to crack down on the protesters. And when you have that kind of breach of trust between you as a university leader and the university um, as students, I, th I think that's a pretty bad thing. You would hope then that your friends on the right would like you, that they would back you up, that they would say, this is great, she's taking a strong hand, da 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 da, da. That didn't happen. 
This is what I mean by the fact she was being squeezed by both sides. So you've got the students who are very understandably deeply unhappy with the fact that their own um, university president called the police on two occasions against them. And also, on the other hand, what you have is a sort of right wing moral panic in the United States, which is drawing in a whole bunch of themes. One is, of course, an anti-Semitism uh, crisis in which it's sort of a, a a cover for Islamophobia. It's all about good ethnicity, bad ethnicity. It's got nothing to do with the safety of Jewish people. It's about defining anti-Semitism in such a way that it becomes indistinguishable from pro-Palestinian activity. Um, those individuals who've been driving that moral panic have also at the same time been driving a moral panic around DEI hires, you know, so that sort of 2020 uh, intake of, of institutional leadership being like, oh, well, you're all DEI hires. And so that's a real talking point of the American right at the moment. Uh, Manoush Shafiq was, was, had both of those things coming at her at once. So, of course, she had those, you know, huge money donors saying, well, we're going to pull our funding unless you take a harder line on these pro-Palestine student encampments. But she's also been accused of being a DEI hire. So I think that this is a, a, a classic example of someone who has made several strategic errors, because if you're going to piss off a giant body upon whom, you know, on whose support you would rely on, you've got to make sure that your backup is there. But certainly wasn't for her. Absolutely, Ash. And I think you're right about your kind of assessments of her. And what I would say is her legacy will be throwing her students under the bus in that really awful congressional address that she gave. And she set the template in many ways for other universities who followed up from her template in the way she addressed students. And we saw these really violent crackdowns on students who were protesting peacefully, by the way. They weren't doing anything wrong. They were protesting peacefully against Israel's bombardment of Palestinians and they were treated with such heavy force by the police. So yeah, I do agree with your assessments of her there. It's A-level results day, meaning students around the country have been anxiously receiving the results. It's also traditionally the day that politicians congratulate students who've made their grades and reassure those who haven't, but there are lots of other options. But universities across the country are currently facing a funding crisis, with half of them facing a deficit, and 69 so far have announced course closures, job cuts, and voluntary redundancy programs going into the new academic year. That's partly due to an over-reliance on international students, who are charged on average £22,000 a year to attend British universities. But that lucrative market now appears to be shrinking. On Sky News, Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson was asked how she'll deal with this problem. From here, what is the lesser evil in, in, in your eyes, or the lesser negative in, in your eyes? Letting uh, the percentage of the total student pool increase from overseas students or putting up the tuition fees that they can charge domestic uh, students? So first of all, it's not the case that international students are taking places that would have otherwise been available uh, to domestic students. In fact, those international students will be cross-subsidising the studies of students from the UK. And we've seen a, a drop, actually, in terms of undergraduate admissions from international students uh, in this phase. Now, Philipson said there that there are international students aren't taking places of domestic students. And that is true. But with few international students choosing to come to Britain, Domestic students do seem to be having better luck at getting places. UCAS figures released this morning show more students from poor backgrounds have won places at British universities as the number of applicants from China has dropped. The Times report says this. In England, 22,640 18-year-olds from the most disadvantaged backgrounds gained a place, the highest figure on record. In Wales, the total for this group dropped slightly to 1,200, down from last year's peak of 1,250. The same was true in Northern Ireland, with this year's total of 1,000 down from 1,010 last year. Overall, there are more than 10,000 applicants from the UK heading to university or college than last year. Now, one of the central causes of the drop in international students might be restrictions brought in by the Tory government earlier this year, including heightened fees and restrictions on family members. After those restrictions came in, applications for student visas dropped by 26,000 on the previous year. Here's Philipson on that topic. 
Should uh, the visa restrictions for foreign students that the last government imposed right at the end of their government, so we haven't really seen the full effects of it yet, should those be reversed? We don't intend to change that. But what I do say is that international students who come to our country and study do make a tremendous contribution. I mean, in economic terms, uh, into where it comes to the communities where they will come and live, Sunderland, where I'm a member of parliament, uh, we have lots of students that come from around the world, often as postgraduate students, that study and make a contribution. So you're not going to reduce university funding shortfalls by making it easier for international students to come. That only seems to leave an increase in tuition fees to plug the gap. What about tuition fees for domestic students? They were £9,000 in 2012. If, if they'd been adjusted with inflation, they'd be over £12,500 uh, today. They're not. They're, they're £9,250. So a £250 increase in, in 12 years. I mean, should there be some closer mapping of, of inflation increases? Because clearly costs would have gone up significantly for universities and... Will you at any point in the five years ahead put up tuition fees caps for, for domestic students? So I, I do recognise the challenge and I hear that message um, from institutions as well. But I think that's a really unpalatable thing to be considering, not least because I know that lots of students across the country are already facing big challenges around the cost of living, housing costs. L lots of students I speak to who are already working, uh, lots of jobs, uh, extra hours in order to pay for their studies. There doesn't appear to be much of a plan there. Universities are now dependent on student fees, both domestic and international, for over 90% of their teaching income. Now, before 2012, it was only 64%. And with caps and domestic fees, international students now account for, on average, 20% of the total income of British universities. Now, according to Channel 4's fact check, one in six universities get a third of their income from international students and 14 of them rely on foreign students for over 40% of their income. That makes British universities extremely vulnerable to shifts in the desires of international students to study here. In the context of capped domestic tuition fees, which Philipson suggests she would not only raise, the only other realistic option is the reintroduction of centralised funding. Otherwise, we may be looking at the closure of universities and the erosion of a sector that contributes around £70 billion to the economy each year. Interestingly, the possibility of closures of the institutions that provide life chances to millions of ordinary people didn't come up in that interview. Instead, Philipson was pressed on the impact of Labour's VAT policy on institutions that generally only benefit a small number of a pretty well-off. And if private schools do close uh, as a result of the policy, d does that matter? I want private schools to be an option for those uh, parents who choose to send their children there. Of course, they will be able to continue to do so. I know the parents want to do what's right by their children, and that's absolutely as it should be. But I would just gently point out that 93% of children in our country go to state schools. That's where I'm determined to focus my efforts as Secretary of State to tackle some of those big gaps that we see opening up where it comes to outcomes for our young people, making sure that the background that you're from, the town that you're born, uh, doesn't determine what you can go on to achieve. And that does involve making political choices about how we raise money, how we spend money. And that's what uh, imposing BAT on private schools is all about, driving up standards in our state sector where the majority of your viewers will send their children to school. Now, Ash, I'm an academic, so people must be bored of my thoughts about the state of higher education. But what do you make of Philipson's comments today and the state of higher education funding in Britain? Well, I mean, just to briefly talk about Labour's uh, VAT imposition or really getting rid of the VAT exemption on private school fees. I mean, that's an example where Bridget Phillipson and also many of her other Labour parliamentary colleagues have a really strong answer. And they're making a political case, right? It's not a little technical one in the background. They're saying, look, we're making a choice and we're choosing to prioritise the schools where 93% of you know, the country's kids will go to. And you go, great, that's actually a really strong answer. I want them to go further, but it's a strong answer. And then when it comes to absolutely anything else, when you're talking about making difficult choices, often when you're talking about whether to cut spending or raise tax, and in particular raise tax um, on the wealthy, suddenly it's all like, oh no, we, we're going to have to wait for the OBR. And like, oh no, like we're not going to... 
like it's like they're they're robots like oh we all simply grow the economy and i think it's important to point out that this leadership of the labor party are capable of making good political arguments when they want to and whenever you're seeing them make really weak arguments that is evidence of where their priorities really lie. They simply don't really think it's much of a priority to tax wealth, deal with inequality and fund public services. Because we can see when it comes to uh, VAT on private school fees, they can actually make a case and they're happy to pick a fight. Now, going back to universities, um, I first started uni in 2010. So I think I was the last but one intake that had a £3,000 university fees. Now, when we look at that moment of 2010, we often talk about it as trebling tuition fees and that being the big change to the university model uh, in England and Wales. Of course, that was a massive change, but that wasn't all there was to it because the other thing that the government brought in was a massive change to the funding model. So the treble tuition fees on the one hand and then absolutely slashed government funding on the other. So you had a 40 percent cut on teaching budgets. You had you know, even more cuts going, uh, being implemented in, in further education as well. So it was a massive transformation of the funding model. And another big transformation was viewing students not as citizens exercising their right to access education, but as customers making a choice in a market. Now, that's got a huge amount of relevance when you're looking at the problems facing higher education today, because, yes, you're seeing a massive problem of funding shortfall, right? Just a huge, huge problem of funding shortfall because those tuition fees basically stayed the same. Uh, the costs of running a, uni a university kept going up and you also don't have government funding coming in to take its place. So obviously you have an escalating crisis, a deepening crisis rather than a sustainable funding model. The second thing that students often talk about is overcrowding. So they'll talk about having a, a lack of contact time or a lack of quality contact time, uh, classes getting bigger, university facilities uh, you know, having having more demand on them. Why? That's because in order to make up for the funding shortfall, universities just have to cram more students in. And because international students pay higher fees than domestic students, who's more valuable? Well, it's international students. And the third thing is when you look at education as a market and students as customers, one of the things that gets completely chucked out the window is there being an intrinsic value to research, to academia, to teaching and to the preservation of knowledge. So you've got many smaller departments who do really specialised work closing down because they're undersubscribed. You've got other departments really struggling to keep up with the demands of their students because they're oversubscribed. And that's because not everything should be run as a market. Markets are really, really bad for deciding the distribution of resources when what you're looking at is something which is of the public good and the social good rather than looking at a commodity. And I think that's exactly what's happened in higher education. Now, a brave Labour government could say, look, what we're going to do is we're going to completely transform this failing system. And it is a failing system. Students know it. Lecturers know it. The parents of students know it, employers know it, and university, you know, provosts and deans and leaders all know it too. It would actually be quite a popular thing. But I think the real reason why they don't want to do it is because they don't want to look at bolstering uh, government funding to universities uh, by imposing or, or, or hiking tax on, on certain demographics, i.e. the wealthy. They don't want to have that fight. I think you're absolutely right, Ash. And I think we know where Labour's priorities on this issue lie, partly because in the lead up to the election, it wasn't mentioned at all by the party. In many ways, it was this issue they kind of sidestepped. And as someone who's in the sector, obviously, I have a bias towards this issue and I care deeply about it. But we are talking about these really important cultural institutions that, are, you know, help raise millions of people in terms of providing a platform for future jobs. We're talking about some of these institutions closing completely. So, so far, the talk is about maybe departments closing, maybe some courses closing. It's going to get worse over time if this funding model doesn't change. Because what's happened is the Tories and kind of the last 14 years or so, the model of universities is we're going to cut funding by the government and we're going to rely on tuition fees. Now, 
you have to pick are you going to raise tuition are you going to raise tuition fees in line with inflation every single year because tuition fees are frozen for the last few years so they're not even rising in, in, in line with, with inflation so you have to do that which i would not be in favor of or you have to have some adequate funding from the government so i would prefer that model where the government step in and help the university sector because people don't realize as an academic what's happened with this new model is thousands of academic staff are being exploited right thousands of academic staff are in precarious work six-month contracts really short-term contracts now the problem that has and, and the effect that has on those academics is this constant fear of losing your job this constant fear of what's next what's next and that feeling of being a precarious member of staff can't be conducive to producing high quality teaching right because you're constantly worried about the future so i do think this is an issue that labor has sidestepped you know so far but as we hear more about courses closing and potentially universities closing it's going to be an issue we're going to need to look at and really deal with squarely because again it wouldn't be a good look for labor if universities across the country are closing down right because these are institutions that are very very important to a lot of people the metropolitan police is failing across almost all areas according to a new damning report the police inspectorates graded the Met's performance in eight key areas, finding its adequate in just one, requiring improvements in five, and inadequate in two. Inexperienced officers are being left to manage over 25 cases at once, leading to what the report describes as inconsistent decision-making and subpar criminal investigations. The force is also accused of failing to effectively manage the risk posed by sex offenders and on loud child abusers. And one shocking finding from this was that officers in parts of London have been tipping off sex offenders before conducting visits rather than making unannounced spot checks. Now, the man responsible for this report is Lee Freeman. He is the inspector of the constabulary. He was on Radio 4 this morning. You also say that there, there is a culture in the Met that makes some officers and staff reluctant to speak out about poor behaviour. And that will worry people because tackling that culture, tackling the Met's culture, has been a really central feature, hasn't it, of, of, of what the, the Chief Constable wants to do, of what everyone says is necessary in the Met. Um, it's really striking that you find it still isn't necessarily happening. It's not still there. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable at this stage with a service the size of the Metropolitan Police that 18 months into the new commissioner's tenure, that is still a work in progress. It is a central part of the new Met for London plan, which is changing the culture of the organisation. I don't think it was unsurprising for us to find that there were still officers and staff who were struggling with that and it hadn't completely penetrated through the organisation yet. Um, the plan articulates that is the intention and we shall continue to support the force and report to the public on how that is being progressed. There's been an awful lot of investment around frontline leadership by the force, probably more so than any time in its history. Um, uh, and I'm optimistic that some of the uh, outcomes from that investment will start to come through. It certainly needs right. to be seen and felt by the public more consistently. The latest report finds that the Met is now inadequate or failing in two critical areas crime investigations and offender management. Both have deteriorated since the last inspection. The Met is now only half as likely as other forces to solve victim-based crime and the quality of investigations, particularly for neighbourhood crimes, was deemed generally poor, with many cases left without proper inquiry. The force recorded nearly 790,000 victim-based crimes in the year ending September 2023, with 4.1% leading to justice far below the national average of 9.8%. A Met spokesman admitted the, find the findings reflect the force's own concerns and said they are already working on the improvement plan. Now, despite this grim assessment, there seems to be no immediate threat to Mark Rowley's position as the commissioner of the Met. In fact, insiders suggest his reform plan is seen as the right approach. Although concerns do persist about the Met's defensiveness, as one white horse horse put it, what is plan B? Now, Ash, the Met find themselves once again in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. What is your read of the implications of the report and policing in Britain more broadly? 
Well, yeah, I mean, you're totally right. The Met really can't get a good news day because if it isn't a police unit literally riddled with sex offenders, then it's a report coming out saying that they're basically failing on every single metric. Now, I think some of the reasons why that's happening aren't solely to do with the police. I think that you have to look at the broader context of austerity and in particular, the cuts to local council services. So because this has been going on for you know over 14 years now, where you've got these cuts to really essential services, whether it's Sure Start, whether it's social services, whether it's early intervention, whether it's mental health care, all of these things which have a really important role in crime prevention and reducing the likelihood that someone is going to be uh, born and raised in such an environment which makes them more likely to commit crime. So you cut all of those things. What you do is, is you create a, a time bomb, right? You, you, you make it more likely that people are going to commit violent crime and you also create a generation of people who are more likely to commit certain kinds of crime. Um, simply because they don't have that support in place. So that's one thing. The second thing is that as those services um, got cut, you do see whether it's the police or in fact teachers in schools, they sort of become a, a public service provider of last resort. So all of these support services get cut and then it's up to police or teachers to sort of deal with with what's left. Um, and that's why you see teachers saying things like, well, I have to bring in food because my kids are coming in hungry or I have to wash the clothes of kids whose parents can't afford to do that because they're essentially being a public service provider of, of last resort. When it comes to the police, that means that all of those problems, which are to do with lack of adequate mental health care, uh, lack of adequate rehabilitation, uh, lack of adequate substance abuse support, then it all gets treated as a criminal justice issue. So you've got greater demands on, on their capacity. Um, you have the Theresa May era cuts to police funding. I mean, I think that's why if you're going to, and I have sympathy with this, if you're going to make uh, structural demands of policing in the UK, they are going to be different from the demands in the US. In the US, they say defund the police. The Tories in this country are like, already did it, mate. Um, that, I think that the real question here is, is police responsibilities and police powers. Um, but those cuts did really have an impact. And you also have this context where different governments are making contradictory demands on the police. We have a really, really weird political culture where we want the police to go left and right at the same time. So we want bobbies on the beat, but we also want more intelligence-led policing. Um, we want uh, police to deal with things like burglaries and robberies and bike thefts. We also want them to focus on really complex crimes uh, like sex crimes, right, which are quite complex to, to investigate um, and to investigate well enough to have a realistic prospect of a, of a conviction. Um, so I think within that context, it's not surprising to me that the, the police are doing badly. One of the impacts of that, I think, is this generalised sense of society being in decline. I mean, I live in London, right? London has better infrastructure funding than lots of parts of the country, lots of you know, lots of good things about living here. But there are certain things that happen, you know, when I go out and I leave my house and I see what's going on, which I think lots of people can identify with from other parts of the country too. So for instance, when I'm going to uh, the local corner shop, there's a little cut through. Um, and it's not a, a, a sketchy cut through. It's not one of those cut throughs where you go, oh, I feel unsafe to be here. Like it's fairly open. Um, but still, it can be like 6 p.m. and there'll be a circle of people taking heroin, just there, like sitting out, like do, doing it loud and proud. Now, I don't think that that should be predominantly a criminal justice issue. I think that that's a, a mental health and substance abuse support issue. I'm not saying that like, where are the police? They should arrest them. But it does contribute to a feeling of lack of safety, um, a, a sense of volatility, a sense of something's gone really wrong because you've got this kind of, you know, disruptive and, and antisocial behavior going on in public, you know, kids who walk down there and you've got a sense of going well this is this is a society that's in decline it's a society that's in free fall this shouldn't be happening in the street and so i think that there's so many examples and this is before you start talking about things like violent crime where people look around them and they go 
we have tolerated um, a, a level of of volatility, of of disruptive behaviour, of uncared for people um, behaving in ways which which are disruptive, and I, I, I lack faith in in the government and I lack faith in the police to do anything to deal with that. So, just to clarify that I don't think that police are the only solution to these issues that I'm talking about. I'm not even saying that they're the first solution to the problems that I'm talking about. But I think that we've ended up with a vicious cycle where you've got greater demands on on police time because these other services have been cut to shreds. And you've got an under underperforming police force, which always then leads more people to say, well, we need police crackdowns rather than investment in these other services, um, which I think is really bad. Yeah, I think you're right, Ash. And I think I see this moment as a really critical moment in the future of policing because you think back to 2020 and it's kind of really big protests we saw around Black Lives Matter. Now, they really raised concerns about policing in Britain, right? We, we saw plenty of people talk about, well, actually, the UK has its own issues when it comes to kind of assaulting black men in, in police custody, deaths in police custody by police officers. You know, all of these things were raised during that moment. And then we had Sarah Everard soon after that, again, concerns about you know violence against women and i think what we what happened what's happening now is there is really widespread distrust in the police for a number of reasons right now there are some people who will do the whole oh there's two-tier policing against you know white people that's quite clearly obviously not true but there are genuine issues with policing in, in this country and i do think this is a really critical moment because this trust is so widespread for so many different reasons that it needs to be addressed because like you said i think one of the issues with policing isn't that we need more than one on the street it's actually about we need to reassess the role of police officers. So should they be the ones responding to a group of people taking heroin on the streets? Probably not. I think that's, a, again, as you mentioned, a health issue. And we need some kind of other mechanism to intervene in that situation. So I do think in many ways, the debate on policing isn't, you know, it's different from the US context, right? So we're not talking about defund the police. What we're talking about here is we need to rethink the role of the police. We need to not stretch them in ways that mean their role becomes like this kind of dual role of we're going to need you to deal with petty crime, also it's really important big crimes. Does that actually mean when we need to shrink the responsibility of police in some ways, have a more focused approach so you can actually be more competent in addressing some issues? Because I know people in London, for example, when it comes to things like bike theft or phone theft, you'd often hear friends complain and say, look, nothing's happening. You know, my bike was stolen, nothing's happened. Now that can't be a way a society is going to run. And I'm not one of those like law and order people to throw them all in prison kind of person. But there does need to be some retribution or something that happens when these crimes do occur. And I think for many people, the police are just seen as very, very incompetent. So that kind of image of the police as incompetent can't be a good thing. And I think it's something that does need to change. Train Drivers Union, Aslef, and the government have struck a deal that could end more than two years of train strikes. The deal includes backdated pay rises of 5% for 2022, 4.7% for 2023, and 4.5% for this year's pay. Now, the offer we we put to members of ASLEF, and the General Secretary, Mick Whelan, says he expects members will accept the deal. Now, if members approve the deal, it will put an end to a standoff with 16 English train operating companies stretching back to July 2022. On this news, Transport Secretary Louise Haig released this video. When I became Transport Secretary, I said we'd move fast and fix things. And that's exactly what we're doing. I'm delighted that we have put forward a three-year pay deal so that drivers across our railways can vote on it and hopefully bring an end to over two years of damaging strikes that have cost the taxpayer more than £800 million in lost revenue and hurt the economy even more. The previous government deliberately provoked and prolonged these strikes and hurt passengers and the economy. In direct contrast, this Labour government will always put passengers first. Haig there put in blame on the Tories by saying the previous government deliberately provoked and prolonged the strikes. Now, she's obviously happy to say that these strikes will hopefully come to an end, but the right-wing papers and the Conservative Party aren't so happy. The Times, the Mail and the Telegraph all led today with accusations from the Tories that the government had caved in to unions. This was Tory leadership candidate Tom Tugendhat. This is again the Labour Party uh, feeding the union paymasters that they've always obeyed. And I'm afraid what this isn't focused on is the real need for massive investment that we need to make a commitment to in order to make sure that people, the travelling public, those people who are actually 
delivering the jobs and the opportunities that the British people need to survive and to do, to deliver the, the greater future that we have, that they actually have the full opportunity to enjoy the services that we need. Now, that's where the challenge comes. Now, whenever we've done pay rises as Conservatives, we've always asked for productivity benefits. We've always asked for transformations in working environments to make sure that we're getting more bang, as it were, for your buck, so that people's money, after all, it's not government money, it's mm. your money, actually goes further. But they kept saying no, didn't they? They kept saying no and then continuing to threaten strike. But the right thing to do is to be careful, Emily. You know that. It's to be careful with public money. You don't need me to tell you this. You, you advocate it. Both of you advocate it all the time. It's not my money. It's not our money as a government or our money as, a, as elected officials. It's your money. It's the British people's money. And it's being spent on Labour's union paymasters for them to settle their internal disputes. Labour's union paymasters. Here, shadow leader of the Commons, Chris Philp. 14% rise for train drivers taking average salaries to 69k for a four-day week, 22% for doctors and a further 10 billion of pay rises at over two times inflation for many other public sector workers. These are choices the Labour government is making that will lead to tax rises this autumn. Now Ash, what do you think of this? Labour haven't really been clear about how they're going to fund this and it is a bit hazy and I think you spoke about this in the lead up to the election about how Labour weren't really being honest about the numbers and the matter of issues. So what do you think of this? Well, I am going to talk about the politics and serious stuff in a second, but that GB News clip I just found so funny. I'm so sorry. You had Tom and Emily, I think, just like staring into the camera, trying to give it their like most serious news anchor faces and doing this nodding. And then when Tom Tugendhat was like, well, you've, you've, t- you know, talked about tax this way and they looked so happy to be recognised by a politician. Um, it was like seeing... Um, I guess like a bring your dog to work day where you get to like take a photo of like a golden doodle like sitting at the desk and like pretending they're typing at a computer. I thought it was actually quite sweet. Um, But onto the politics of it. Um, This was exactly what I said in the run up to the election, which is having gone through the Labour manifesto with a fine tooth comb, they had fully costed various things, but there were things that they said that they were going to do like resolve pay disputes in various sectors, deal with staff retention in the NHS and in education. And the only way in which that was going to happen would be pay increases. Now, those pay increases weren't costed. They weren't even really discussed by Labour. They just said, OK, well, we're going to get around the negotiating table. Now, while I disagree in principle with the idea of doing dishonest politics, which is you say one thing and then you do another when you get into power. I do think that this does make strategic sense for Labour to say what we're going to do is we're going to deal with these long-running industrial disputes in the NHS uh, and in the railways very, very quickly. We're going to try and deal with that within the first month or two months of being in government. Now, that's smart because I think that one of the things which brought the Tories so low was the fact there was so much disruption in these key public services. What the Conservatives had hoped was that by prolonging strike action in the NHS or in the railways, that it would turn the public against uh, the junior doctors and turn the public against uh, railway workers. And while public polling was, you know, obviously pick your poll, say the thing you want it to say. While public polling wasn't necessarily in full-throated support of the unions or indeed the strike action, it was pretty much behind the idea of, oh, just like settle this already. It's the government's responsibility. It's not the union's responsibility. And the government need to come up with a serious pay deal. So it does make sense to me that that's what Labour have gone for. It was a dishonest way to do it. And the thing which bothers me more than... Labour's dishonesty because fish going to swim, birds going to fly, politicians going to lie through their teeth. That's that's the order of things. Is that there were so many journalists in establishment media going along with the deception. So when you just say, all right, here are some really massive uncosted things. They say that they're going to deal with staff retention and they're not saying how much they're going to pay more. You had all journalists being like, oh, we just choose not to see it. And that's because it was a deception that was in line with their own politics. Now, again, this is a deception which is somewhat in line with my own politics because I thought that these people deserved a pay rise. But as a journalist, your job is to to push at it and to make politicians give you a decent answer. Um, 
Unfortunately, many of our colleagues in the industry didn't want to do that for some special reason. Yeah, I think you're right, Ash. And I cast my mind back to 2019 and so much talk about the Labour Manifesto being uncosted, right? So all this stuff about, you know, free broadband caused such polemic responses. Like, oh my gosh, where are they getting this money from? And there was such scrutiny over every single policy, like literally every single policy, like this is not funded, this is not funded, that's not funded. Whereas with Labour last time, it felt like there was such like a acceptance that Labour were going to win the election, they're going to coast to victory, let's just... And it just felt like they had an easy ride. And this massive issue when it comes to how they're going to fund these really big commitments that they're now making wasn't placed under any scrutiny. And we're now seeing some kind of right-wing papers go, oh, look at this, look at that. But during the election, so many journalists gave Labour the most cushy ride possible. It was such a peaceful ride, no real scrutiny on these really big issues. And only now are we seeing, especially on the right especially, some kind of pushback against this and some kind of like, wait, what's going on here, guys? So I do think you're right here that there was so many chances for journalists to ha- really be like, well, actually, start, well, actually, what do we think of this? Where, where's the money going to come from? And that wasn't, didn't happen during the election cycle. Now, we should say that one thing that strengthens the Tories' criticism is that Labour have not said how they're going to pay for the train driver's paying deal. Now, when pressed on this on Radio 4, on this very question, Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson refused to give an answer. And one thing that refusal feels is also random speculation amongst the general public. And that leads us to comments such as this from a caller to Jeremy Vine this morning. So I think what they've done is they've took it off pensioners' winter fuel allowance to give the train drivers their pay rise. Is it, is and I think what's sim- going to... Sorry, is it that simple Sorry. though, Geraldine? Because other, if we keep doing this and saying that's my money that I used to have and it's gone there, we're, we're actually missing the, the focus that, that we all bear this cost one way or another. Yeah, but then do you not think there's going to be a lot more older people now who will probably die or get ill because they haven't got that... But Geraldine, when, I agree with you. the train drivers for that. The, Ger- and it's gone to the train drivers. Geraldine, this is divide and rule. This is uh, turning people who deserve something against each other. You're right, I oppose Labour attacking the winter fuel payments, which, by the way, includes poorer pensioners who are eligible for pension credit, uh, who don't receive it. They're getting their winter fuel payments taken away from them, being driven into poverty. I think that's scandalous, as well as many other struggling pensioners. But the fact is, this is a rich country. We should be able to tax richer people far more than we do and give pensioners what they deserve, and I agree with you on pensioners completely, as well as ensure that frontline staff who deliver services we all depend on, and if you don't use trains, we depend on it because of the economy, uh, the the salary that they deserve. Let's not play, turn people against each other, pensioners versus train drivers. It should be the vast majority versus people who don't pay their taxes often at the top or aren't paying enough tax. So we have Owen Jones there responding to that kind of caller's conspiratorial take. And Ash, I think Labour governments in particular are vulnerable to accusations of where's the money coming from? So what do you think Labour needs to do to kind of maybe sway those fears and maybe stop maybe some conspiratorial takes and some, some kind of wild takes from members of the general public? Well, I think they have to say where the money's coming from. And there are various ways in which they could do that. Um, they could say that they're actually going to change some of their own fiscal rules, that they're going to uh, pay down the national debt um, at a different rate. They could um, fiddle with some of the Bank of England rules and go, oh my God, look, I just found 20 billion pounds. I mean, like, you know, they can do that. Or they could come up with a overarching framework where they go, all right, Um, in order to pay for these things, we're going to tax the rich this much. And that would give them an awful lot of leeway. Instead, what they've done is they've said, well, we're not going to do any tax rises and we're not going to do any borrowing um, and we're going to fully cost everything. And it does invite people to look at things like pay increases or funding increases to different elements of the public sector and go, okay, well, what what are you taking that money away from? Because yes, it is conspiratorial to say that they slashed pensioners winter fuel allowance um and you know they've transferred that money into the pockets of of aslef uh train drivers but that's the internal logic of how labor are approaching budgeting anyway so you kind of can't blame people for for coming to that conclusion i think the the last thing that i would say about it though 
is that during the most uh, during the recent uh, racist riots up and down the country, one of the things that did come up amongst people who were um, you know protesting outside uh, hotels where asylum seekers were were being held um, was that they were saying, well, we've just had our uh, winter fuel allowance taken away, and yet you're you're putting up these guys in in hotels. Now, again, I think that that's wrong. I think it's wrong to protest those hotels. Um, I, I think that it's fine to oppose the policy of dispersal, but this was actually about intimidation and and, and a feeling of of peril for people who'd gone through unspeakable things already. Um, but that that sort of approach to messaging your spending, while it's going to get a lot of people who work for, you know, the Economist or for the Observer going ho 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 ho, sensible politics. The way in which it's received by people is very much, as Owen said, divide and rule because it looks at every single funding decision as a competition. So I think that this is something which, in the in the medium to long term, could hurt Labour. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Ash, and I think especially as they are going to have to make several more funding commitments, there needs to be a clarity over what's going on you know where's this money coming from right that's it let's wrap up here ash thank you so much for joining me on my debut hosting of our live it was just it was an honor to be your first mate and i hope we do it again uh and thank you to everyone for watching this evening the show will be back tomorrow with michael walker from six o'clock you've been watching of media good night